Okay. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get started? It is afternoon. It's two minutes after 12, so I will say good afternoon. Um, I'm Mike Engelga. I'm the Deputy Director for the Center for Translation Research and Implementation Science at the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute, NHLBI. And I'd like to welcome you all, all of you who are here in this amphitheater and also those of you who are live streaming uh, online uh, to the 12th lecture of the Genomics and Health Disparities Lecture Series. Uh, this series highlights the opportunity of genomics research to specifically address health uh, disparities. In addition to the NHLBI, the National Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities, NIMHD, the National Human Genome Research Institute, NHGRI, and the National Institutes of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Diseases, NIDDK, along with the Office of Minority Health at the Food and Drug Administra uh, Administration um, are all involved with this. Uh, the speakers have been chosen um, very selectively by a series of uh, uh, co-sponsor uh, selections um, uh, from the institutes and uh, present their research on the ability of genomics to improve health for all populations. Um, as, as it is often a challenging to make sure that improvements in health reach all the populations. Uh, the speakers uh, in this series also tackle this challenge from different areas of research, including basic science, population, genomics, and translational and clinical research. Uh, today, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Minoli Pereira from the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. Dr. Pereira is an associate professor of pharmacology with their Center for Pharm Pharmacogenomics. And just a little bit about Dr. Pereira. In addition to uh, earning a dual uh, doctoral degrees, one a PhD researcher and a clinical PharmD degree, uh, she was trained as a fellow at the Clinical Pharmacology and Pharmacogenetics at the University of Chicago. After her two-year clinical fellowship, uh, she trained with the Human Genetics Laboratory of Dr. Anna De Renzo, uh, studying novel variants related to pharmacogenetic differences in CYP3A4 in African Americans. The training highlighted the complexity of genetic studies in admixture populations and integrated her clinical and basic science backgrounds, making her ideally suited for translational work in pharmacogenetics. Uh, Dr. Pereira has been funded by both the NHLBI and the American Heart Association to investigate novel genetic variants associated with the anticoagulant uh, warfarin and its responses. She's uh, expanded this initial focus from warfarin to drugs and its other drug metabolisms and its role in pharmacogenetics uh, through support from NIMHD to investigate genetic variation in drug metabolizing enzymes, specifically in African Americans. The work spans all pharmacologic areas and has allowed for a more in-depth understanding of how these important genes are regulated and she also has recognized the importance of making sure we get all populations, including African Americans, uh, represented in the research uh, that she's doing. She's received the Diversity Award from the University of Chicago in recognition for her leadership in promoting diversity in science through mentorship of underrepresented minority trainees. Uh, she was also the 2016 Leon uh, Goldberg Young Investigator Award recipient uh, from the American Society of Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics for her ongoing scientific work in African-American pharmacogenetics. She's currently the PI for one of five transdisciplinary uh, collaborative centers funded through NIMHD uh, with the acronym ACCOUNT, uh, standing for African-American Pharmacogenetics Cardiovascular uh, Consortium, and her team collaborates uh, on work to accelerate the discovery and translation of pharmacogenetics in Af African-American ancestry populations. She's extremely well published, uh, and it's important to acknowledge uh, her most recent publications in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association and the annual, annual Review of Pharmacology and Toxicology. 
So please uh, join me in giving a very warm welcome uh, to Dr. Uh, Parara to NIH. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to speak here, and especially with such a, a great audience. It's been a, a wonderful uh, morning so far, meeting all of you and discussing science and uh, minority health and pharmacogenomics. And it's been very interesting and, and certainly very enlightening. And so I hope you uh, are interested. My The title of my talk is From Genomics to Multiomics, and it focuses on the fact that precision medicine is now moving out of just the genomic space into other types of data and how we should really be thinking about that. But for me, it's thinking about it on the background of an African ancestry genome. And um, I, I wanted to just a little preamble is that I, I start out with some of my very early work, which was well before the time of GWAS, and, and maybe that's dating myself a little bit. But uh, and then and how it kind of uh, led me to think about what we do even now, even today, what I think about it is framed by some of those early experiences. So uh, I think it's really fortuitous. This, this uh, review came out in, in Cell, I think, maybe on Thursday or Friday of last week. And it really, it, it was by one of your former uh, lecturers here, Dr. Tishkoff. And it, it really highlights what's going on. We've been talking about lack of diversity in genomics for maybe over a decade now. And we've been trying to improve upon this. And as you can see, we've done better with the number of GWASs that are conducted. Uh, a little over half are being done in European uh, ancestry individuals, with the rest being in other uh, ancestries. But when we look at the individuals that are represented here, you can see that most of them are still European. And when I look at this little yellow triangle here, those are the non-European, non-Asian participants. They make up 3% of all of the individuals that are involved in GWAS studies in the, in the, geno in the GWAS catalog currently. So for me, my, my focus is on African Americans, but specifically in pharmacogenomics. And even in pharmacogenomics, most of our studies have been done in European populations. And what was done early was to use the information we found in European populations and see if those translated or just use them in other populations. And I don't think, unsurprisingly, I think to many in the audience, it didn't work very well. They weren't translatable. And that meant that we really need to think about what drives those phenotypes, those drug response phenotypes in other populations. And that's where I started my work. Um, I contend that this continu continuing lack of, of African American and African ancestry genomes in pharmacogenomics is, is contributing to health disparity in pharmacogenomics because we won't be able to translate to them. If what we find in Europeans doesn't predict uh, well the re response in other populations, then really what are we doing? How are we going to translate to all US populations? And really, there continues to be a lack, not just of genomic data, because that's, that's starting to change, but genomic data with well-phenotyped clinical data. So here, I, I pulled this yesterday, actually. This is from uh, TCGA, and it's an amazing resource. There's so much data there, so much multiomic data there. And I just pulled this for a few of the cancer subtypes. For those who don't know, TCGA is a cancer repository for genomes of, of thousands of people with different types of cancers. So I picked cancers that were disparate between Europeans and African ancestry people. So you know, it's the big players we think of, breast cancer, prostate cancer, uh, colorectal cancer, stomach cancers. And you can see here, this is for all the people uh, in the repository. Over 8,000 samples are there with lots of different types of data. But if I restrict it just to those of African ancestry, we drop down to 262 samples in TCGA. And again, these are cancers that have greater morbidity and mortality between Europeans and African Americans. And just in, in a cancer like prostate cancer, so important for the African American community, there are only seven prostate cancer cases in TCGA. But we know that there may be underpinnings of African uh, ancestry prostate cancer that are different than uh, cancers that are in other ethnicities. But can, we can't really uh, study that with seven. And this is what I mean by well-phenotyped big data that we can use to answer questions. 
Uh, the other really amazing resource um, that was funded through the Common Fund is the GTEx. This is a really large consortium effort that links genotype to gene expression in 44 human tissues. Just a monumental effort and just an amazing resource, one that I use all the time. And this is the race breakdown of those uh, individuals in GTEx. And as you can see, it's not too bad. 12.7% are African American. This gave me a lot of hope for what we do because linking genotype to gene expression is one way for, uh, in which we can understand the functional consequences of our genetic findings. But when I looked at GTEx, in the largest uh, tissue type they have, which is skeletal muscle, there are 57 African Americans, which again is not bad. It's actually a really great effort. But know now that GTEx will not run their analysis until they get to 70 individuals. So there is no way to run uh, their sorts of analyses of linking genotype to gene expression on the, on the subsets that are African American. And so that's the best we have right now. Now, that's not to say we're not improving upon that. There are large efforts, the All of Us effort, and now TopMed that are, are turning the tide for this. But for me, who looks at drug response, there's still a lack of data. And, I, and I'll try and highlight that during the talk. What do we really need to uh, to phenotype to get a good pharmacogenomic signal, and how do we do that in other populations? So I, uh, it was mentioned in my introduction that I, I came to my fellowship after my PhD. I joined a human genetics lab. I actually had no formal training in human genetics other than maybe the classes you take in college and maybe in graduate school. But I didn't really understand human genetics. And I was trained in pharmacology, in pharma, in drug metabolism, in pharmacokinetics. And this was kind of my, my way of learning human genetics. And it was just brilliant because I joined a, a population uh, genomics lab and they taught me a lot. Uh, I don't claim to be a human geneticist, but they really enlightened me on what we should be thinking about when we think about genomes. And it really started my passion for pharmacogenomics. So for those who are unfamiliar, the human species arose in Africa. It's right here, that white dot. And we spent many thousands of years living in Africa. And then through waves of migration, we left Africa to colonize the rest of the earth. And we left them in small little groups of individuals that left Africa. And when they did that, they just took a small portion of genomic diversity with them. So the way you should think about this is in Africa, these African ancestry individuals are the oldest population on earth, and they have the most genetic diversity. And as each one of these waves left, they just took a small portion of that genetic diversity with them. And it really it can't, be, it can't encompass the large compendium of genetic diversity we find in African ancestry populations. So when you think about that, African ancestry populations are very unique. Um, I, I also put this quote down here because I, I, I visited the um, the Apartheid Museum in South Africa when I was there. This is a quote from Nelson Mandela, and it's, it's a beautiful uh, integration of science and sociology. Humanity was born in Africa. All people are ultimately African. And I hope you understand, or and this is how I view it, to really understand human genetics, we have to understand African genetic, genetics. And that's where kind of the inspiration for what I do comes from. African Americans are admixed. That means they were recently mixed between African genomes and European genomes. So their genomes are a mixture of these two parental populations. We know there's disparities in disease. I mentioned breast cancer already. But I think about it from the role of drugs and drug metabolism and drug response. There is a difference in drug metabolism um, that's been well known for, for decades now uh, in this gene called CYP3A5. And it's actually where I started my work. The CYP3A locus is a, a drug metabolizing a set of genes. They metabolize 60% of all the currently prescribed drugs that we have on the market. They go through these enzymes. African Americans, uh, I'm sorry, Europeans carry a splice variant in CYP3A5. A majority of European ancestry people carry the splice variant. This means that they do not have a functioning CYP3A5 enzyme. But in African Americans and African ancestry populations, there is a much lower frequency of this, uh, this SNP, this splice variant. Therefore, many African ancestry individuals carry a functioning CYP3A5. 
And so that there's a difference here in how we can metabolize drugs that is based on the population, the ancestry in your genome, but we're only now starting to realize that impact in pharmacogenomics. Again, in that review that I mentioned that came out in Cell, it beautifully illustrated the, the power as well as the complexity of using an African ancestry genome to uncover causal variants. So for those who are unfamiliar, when we do genome-wide association studies, we don't always find the causal variant. Sometimes we just find it a variant linked to it uh, or associated with it. We call this linkage disequilibrium. But the, the problem is that that linkage is different between populations. So you can see here, here's a tag SNP or a linked SNP to the causative SNP that's European. But the one in African Americans is actually at a different position. And in general, these um, extent of linkage disequilibrium in African Americans is much shorter. So usually that, that tagging SNP is going to be closer to the causal variant than when you, when you use a European population. But there's another situation that could arise. Maybe at the same locus there's a causal variant in Europeans, but there's a different causal variant in Africans. And therefore, the different SNPs are just tagging different variants, and that adds a different sort of complexity to understanding our genome-wide association studies. I, I pulled this quote because I think it, it illustrates some of the ongoing issues of adding diversity into our genome studies. So while we do that, we, we, we build these diverse uh, populations. Um, they're usually studied as part of a larger meta-analysis that estimates association from combined data. So that means that we'll find things that are common across populations. Again, a very important piece of genomic uh, understanding to have, but we will not find population-specific uh, causes for disease or pharmacogenomics with those sorts of methods. I also want to highlight the power of using an African ancestry genome. So for many of you, you may know the drug PCSK9 inhibitors, the ones that are now used to lower LDL cholesterol. The original studies that discovered the, the coding variants in this gene were actually found in African American populations. And that's because African Americans carried these coding variants at higher frequencies than European ancestry individuals. So here we have the use of an African ancestry genome to discover a new druggable target that led to a new group of drugs that benefit all of us. But really, it was the power of the African American genome that helped us uncover this. So here's some of my early work. Um, you can tell this is well before we really <laughs> did genome-wide studies. And this was a sequencing study I did across the CYP3A4 locus. And this arrow actually shows the splice variant at CYP3A5. And what I want you to notice is in Europeans, and, and this is a Chinese population, they, they have very similar variants. The blue are the SNPs. Yellow is what we would consider wild type. But with African Americans, there's a lot more diversity here. So my question was, if I looked at that increased diversity, would I be able to find something that associated with drug metabolism? Uh, it was a very naive sort of question, and what I did is I recruited African Americans that were going under colonoscopy. They get an IV dose of midazolam. It's an anti-anxiety medication. And then I looked at how fast they metabolized the midazolam compared to their genotypes. It was uh, one of those early you know, fellow studies that I did. And, we did find a variant that affected it that was African, African ancestry specific. And at the time, there were limited resources to do gene expression, but we found a liver bank uh, and collaborated with, uh, with St. Jude to look at um, what the effect of that SNP was. And it showed that the uh, minor allele caused decreased expression of CYP3A4. But when we looked in hep G cells, it caused increased, um, uh, increased expression. Um, in, a, in a luciferase study. So here we have contradictory findings, and it, it's part of the, of the puzzle that big data is helping us understand. This is before the, the time of big data, so we have lower expression, but higher expression in, in a immortalized cell line. I'd also like to point out that hep G cells were isolated from a European uh, cancer, liver cancer donor. So they're really on the background of a European genome, which is the case for most of our immortalized cell lines. Uh, save a few uh, notable exceptions. <laughs>
After uh, my work in CYP385, I, I still always thought about drug metabolism, but I was starting my own lab and I started to look at warfarin. Warfarin is an anticoagulant. Uh, anticoagulant that's been used for decades now. Um, many of you know it. It's used across cardiology for uh, uh, thrombotic conditions, strokes, atrial fibrillation. And at the time, there had been several candidate gene studies and GWAS studies looking at if there were uh, genetic variants that determined the dose of warfarin. Because at the time, warfarin, you could require two milligrams a day, you could re require 20 milligrams a day, and your physician would have a hard time knowing which of these, where in that spectrum you would need to be. So many physicians started at five and titrated your dose until you were therapeutic. Um, all of the studies in Asians and European populations pointed to these three genes, CYP2C9, VCORC1, and uh, CYP4F2, as having genetic variants that uh, significantly associated with dose. But if we took those exact same variants and looked in an African-American population, they predicted less of the variability in dose, significantly less. Um, and, and that's accounting, too, for all of the non-genetic factors, age, weight, renal function, smoking. We still explain far less of the variability. If you talk to physicians or cardiologists that use this drug, they'll tell you that African Americans required a higher dose of the drug than other populations. So this led us down the road of thinking, maybe there's something population specific. At the same time um, that we were doing our work, these two trials came out. One is the COAG trial. That was an NHLBI-sponsored trial in the US. And the UPAC trial, which was a European trial. Both of these trials, while they were different in many ways, were trying to answer the same question. If you use genotype to guide the dose of warfarin, would you have better uh, clinical outcomes for a patient? And these were the results of those trials. In UPAC, if you use genotype to guide the dose of warfarin, you significantly improved uh, several different clinical measures in, in patients taking the drug. In the COAG trial, which was an ethnically diverse population, there was no statistical difference between genotype guided versus clinically guided. But for us, what was interesting was the, uh, the subset that was African-American. So if you just looked at the African-Americans, if you used genotype to guide their warfarin dose, they did statistically worse, meaning for all of the clinical outcomes that a physician would care about, they did worse. And this was uh, really important and big news for people working in warfarin pharmacogenomics in African-Americans, as you might imagine. The same year as those trials were published, we published our work uh, as a consortium. This was a consortium of seven different institutions that ran a GWAS for a warfarin dose requirement in African Americans. And for those unfamiliar, this is a Manhattan plot. Each dot is a SNP that we tested for association. And uh, genome-wide significance is this top dotted line. So we did find VCORC1, just as other studies had found. But we also found this SNP here. Um, this SNP is upstream of the CYP2C9 gene cluster. CYP2C9 uh, actually metabolizes warfarin. It's been well known to carry variants that affect warfarin dose. But what was really significant here is that the minor allele frequency for the SNP was 25%. That means that in a practical sense, 47% of African Americans carry at least one copy of this SNP. When we looked to see what was the clinical impact of just the SNP after you took out the effect of age and weight and interfering medications, if you carry one copy, you have to decrease the dose of warfarin by almost 7 milligrams per week. If you carry two copies, that requires a 10 milligram, almost 10 milligram decrease in dose. Um, these data are now incorporated in the CPIC guidelines. For those who are unfamiliar, CPIC is a uh, clinical guidelines for the use of pharmacogenomic information. And they now have incorporated these African-specific SNPs. I also want to note that this SNP, along with other known African-American sorry, specific SNPs were not included in those clinical trials that I mentioned. So you can imagine that for the African Americans in those trials, they may have been mis-cataloged uh, as requiring a normal dose of warfarin when really they needed an alternative dose. But it's because we weren't looking at genetic variants that affect that population specifically.
Um, when we were publishing this data, we were asked what the function of this SNP was. And at the time, we could not answer that question. And the reason is that you need high density liver expression data with enough people that carry the SNP, but they all had to be African American. Because the SNP is actually found in Europeans, but is not associated with dose. So it's not the causal variant. It's probably linked to a causal variant. But to understand the function or what the causal variant is, you have to look on the background of an African ancestry pop, uh, genome, which we didn't have access to at the time. So warfarin um, is now being replaced by many new drugs. The, uh, so-called DOAX or direct uh, acting um, anti-10A inhibitors, uh, but they still remain. And they remain because many physicians are comfortable with them. And there are also guidelines around uh, renal function and the use of these new, um, new drugs. So they still remain. And I, may, I might say they, there is a case for continuing to think about warfarin as well as the SNPs that affect warfarin because they are many African Americans carry at least one of these variants. So they have a larger proportion of their population that may be actually affected and need an alternative dose. The second study I took after finishing our, our warfarin pharmacogenomics was actually a, a disease susceptibility study in venous thromboembolism, or VTE. This uh, comes in kind of several different flavors, deep vein thrombosis, which are clots in, in, that can form in the deep veins of your legs. These clots can break off and travel to your lungs, and that's called a pulmonary embolism. And both of these types of deep uh, VTE affect African Americans uh, at a higher rate, and they have higher mortality from these. So this is uh, work that was done by my former postdoc here, Wendy Hernandez, and we ran a GWAS of this, and, and we did find genome-wide significant um, variant in chromosome 7, but we, when we went to replicate this work, we replicated SNPs down here in chromosome uh, 20. You can see them here. And when we went to GTEx, we were, it was really fortunate. They actually had people with that rare variant, and it associated significantly with the expression of a gene called thrombomodulin. We went into a second cohort. This was a diverse cohort with Hispanics, uh, African Americans, uh, white South Asians that had uh, venous thromboembolism and controls. And we showed that throm uh, thrombomodulin was significantly differentially expressed between cases and controls. And, and I think this is a, a great time to point out this was public data. So this is reuse of public data to help us understand or gain a greater understanding of the biology of our GWAS finding. So what is thrombomodulin? Is this it's this protein down here. Um, it actually binds thrombin and prevents it from going through the rest of the coagulation process. And it also has a, a, a negative feedback to some of the vitamin K dependent clotting factors upstream of thrombin. So you can think of thrombomodulin as kind of being the brakes on the coagulation system. But for African Americans, and I want to say this was not a rare variant, it had a minor allele frequency of 20%. Uh, they have a lower expression of this gene and hence an increased risk for, uh, for, a thrombo for thrombosis. At the same time as we published this work, we, we had a, a very small study around uh, three to 400 people. This study in Europeans came out with over 10,000 people. And, they, and, and VTE GWASs had been done for many years, and they continued to find the same variants. Uh, factor V Leiden, which is this top SNP here, and prothrombin mutations, which is this F2 SNP. And when we looked in our African Americans, no African American carried any of the associated, uh, uh, the, they didn't carry the factor V Leiden or the prothrombin SNPs. And why I bring this up is clinically right now, you can be tested for uh, risk of, of VTE with these genetic tests. And say for example, that you're an African American woman who's had several VTEs, and now you are pregnant, which is a high thrombotic state and you go to your physician and they decide to run a factor V Leiden or prothrombin genetic tests on you. These tests will come back as negative or not carrying the risk variants for VTE. But that may not mean that you're not at risk for VTE. And for those who don't know, this is Serena Williams. And I put her picture up here because when we were publishing this, many people asked us, is it just environment? Is it just you know, lifestyle that predisposes African-Americans to VTE. Serena Williams is uh, 
you know, one of the top athletes of our generation. She has the best doctors. She's probably the most physically fit person in this room if she were here. And uh, she's had multiple VTEs as well as multiple PEs. I don't know what her genetic profile is, but would her genetic profile then affect this baby that she's now holding? I don't know. And we don't test that right now because we don't test for the correct variants for VTE or for variants that may affect other populations. The last uh, kind of clinical caveat I'll give you is on this study we did on bleeding risk with anticoagulation. So if you're on any anticoagulant, there is always a serious risk or, or there is always a risk of serious bleeding. But fatal or serious bleeding is relatively rare. Um, they, they show here from old studies of warfarin, 1 to 3% had fatal bleeds. Uh, and the risk was greatest in the first 30 days. However, we know that African Americans suffer from bleeding on anticoagulants at a higher rate than other populations. And there are, there are known non-genetic factors that play into this. Chronic kidney disease, which is also more prevalent in African Americans, age, sex, cancer diagnoses. But where does genetics play a role? And, and this comes into my... Um, idea of, of like actually phenotyping people well to figure out if genetics plays a role. Because genetics doesn't play a role in everything. But maybe it does if we ask the right question. And maybe you can find it if we ask the right question. So here's an old study looking at the VCORC variants and the CYP2C9 variants uh, in a white po patient population. And the, uh, the y-axis here is INR, or the therapeutic measure for warfarin. So most physicians want to keep that between two and three. And you can see for, for VCORC variants, there's not really much of a difference. But for the CYP2C9 variant, the STAR3, STAR3 has a really uh, erratic INR early in therapy. But that STAR3, STAR3 variant is carried at very rare frequencies in African Americans. So we took our cohort and we re-phenotyped them for bleeding. But I wanted to be intelligent in how we did bleeding risk. Because there are lots of reasons people can bleed on these drugs. Drug-drug interactions, drug-disease interactions, age, renal function. All of these things are, are not genetic uh, reasons people bleed. Um, maybe you took too much of your medication. Many of these can also be measured by INR. So the higher the INR, the greater the risk of bleeding. So down here, I show the odds ratio of bleeding with the x-axis being the INR measure. And you can see here between two and three, that's the sweet spot that physicians are trying to target with this drug. But really, the bleeding risk doesn't really escalate until four. And all of the guidelines around uh, warfarin maintenance have guidelines around when to reverse therapy. And at an INR of four, and maybe even four and a half, most physicians would probably tell you to skip a dose of your medication, come back and get your INR checked again in three days. So we decided to restrict our bleeds to people that had bleeds that required hospitalization, that occurred while they were on medication, that were the result of medication, and that occurred at an INR less than four. This was to help us predispose to enrich for people with a potential genetic variant for bleeding. In that, where we had very few cases, only 31 cases in our discovery cohort, 40 cases in our replication cohort. But what was really interesting, and maybe not surprising if you're a physician in this room, is that 66% of the bleeds that occurred in our African-American cohort occurred when the INR was below four. So when you wouldn't have a lot of clinical suspicion that this person would have a hospitalized bleed. There, I should also say that there are risk schemas available to, to gauge the risk of your patient's bleeding. And I've listed a few here. We decided to go with Hasbled. Hasbled is a scoring system that gives you points for different sorts of medical or demographic conditions like elderly age or, or hypertension. And the more points you have, the greater your risk of bleeding. And you have here the odds ratios of bleeding as you get more points while on anticoagulation. So uh, my postdoc that worked on this, I told her that if our SNP could do no better than Hasbled, it really isn't 
while it's maybe biologically interesting, it's really not helpful to a patient because a physician could use the scoring system and figure out who's going to bleed. We want to do better than what we can do out of an EHR, just a scoring system. So that's what we did. We um, ran our discovery cohort. We didn't quite reach genome-wide significance, but we were able to replicate. And I want you to look at these odds ratios. While, our, our, while they may be large because our population is small, they really tell you something about the power to discover uh, a, a well phenotype typed uh, adverse event, drug adverse event. And in our rock curve analysis, we did show that adding the SNP to Hasblood significantly improved our, our ability to predict who would bleed at these low INRs uh, while on medication. The SNP we found was in this gene, EPHA7. Um, EPHA7 was not known to, uh, to be associated with any sort of bleeding risk, any thrombophilia sorts of phenotypes. It's actually well known in um, neural development and in uh, cell-cell interactions and adhesions. Uh, the SNP we found is just upstream of this gene, the, the top uh, hit in our GWAS. It's actually part of a four SNP haplotype. And when we look to see what the, that SNP haplotype did, it increased the expression uh, of, of uh, EPHA7. Um, so we started looking, is there any role for EPHA7 in, in, in bleeding risk or in, in coagulation? And what we found was that EPHA4 um, is actually important. It's one of the uh, receptors found on platelets that um, can interact with the endothelium. Uh, and its natural ligand is efferin. However, EPHA7 has been shown to inhibit the interaction of efferin to e EPHA4. Now, this is, seems like a really minor, minutiae sort of detail for coagulation, and I think it is. And I want to think about this in the context of pharmacogenomics. So in all of us, if we're Un, if we aren't taking anticoagulation medications, we have lots of other pathways that prevent us from bleeding, lots of other redundant pathways that make sure that we don't bleed out. But in a patient on anticoagulation, we have inhibited these pathways. And that means that some of the minor pathways that really have no link to disease may now play a major role in preventing adverse events. And that's what we're trying to uncover now. I'm sorry, uncover now. Does EPHA seven and EPHA4 play a role in this minor pathway that actually is very important when you're on medication. So maybe this is why we uncovered it. We used a cohort that was medicated. So I want to switch here from all the clinical studies I've shown you to some of the functional work we do because finding GWAS hits is great, but understanding the biology is just as important. And um, I was inspired by what I told you before, our work on not being able to figure out what that CYP2C variant did in warfarin um, dose requirement. So uh, I decided that there are lots of EQTL studies. I just told you about GTEx and their amazing work with 44 tissues. But I care about drugs, and the liver is a major organ for, for drug metabolism. So I decided to build a liver cohort. But I wanted to try and do everything I could with the, uh, with the, with the simplest, or, or, or do the most I could with one liver if you can think of it that way. And so I kind of did this uh, experiment where you threw the kitchen sink at it and tried to see what was changing. We got livers and extracted living hepatocytes, primary hepatocyte cultures. All of these livers were obtained from African-American donors. And then we did uh, genotyping, we did gene expression, but we didn't do just gene expression. We also treated them with known drug uh, enzyme-inducing drugs. So these are drugs that we know increase the expression of drug metabolizing enzymes. These are uh, well-known drugs such as phenobarbital and phenytoin and rifampin. And then we did another transcriptome. We've added methyl, uh, the methylome, and then we took some of these hepatocytes and we gave them probe drugs to see how fast they metabolize drugs. So here it, we used LCMS to quantitate the metabolite formation rate. And so all of these, it's kind of like doing as much as you can to a person without actually giving a person a bunch of drugs and measuring it in them. 
And you can imagine different ways of combining this data. I'm just going to give you kind of the highlights of, of the first few studies we did. You can look at associations to ancestry. You can do EQTL mapping. That's mapping SNPs that significantly uh, affect the expression of, uh, of genes. You can do differential gene expression, but you can combine this data in many, many different ways. And, and that's what we're hoping to do. By combining this data, can we uncover biology? And one of the first things we wanted to think about was a phenomenon called local ancestry. So I've been talking about African ancestry individuals and US African Americans are admixed between Africans and Europeans. And so this PC plot here kind of shows you the consequence of that in your genome. So when you use PC analysis, you can separate parental populations. This orange here is uh, Asian populations, the blue is European, and the red over here are Yoruba or African populations. African Americans kind of lie on the, on the line between Africans and Europeans. You can see that here. And that means they have varying amounts of African and European components to their genome. And when we've run EQTL analysis or GWAS analysis, we use these PCs to correct for that varying amount of African versus European portions of their genome. But if you think of that, that's like saying someone is 70% African or 80% African. And when you use uh, African uh, ancestry estimations, African Americans are on average about 80% African. Um, but that doesn't give you the granularity that might actually be going on, because admixture means it's a recent mixture between two parental populations. So that's what local ancestry does. So here in this example, I've taken these two black dots, people very, very close on this PC analysis. So having very close amounts of African ancestry percentages, and then did local ancestors local ancestry estimation of their genomes. And here you can see what that looks like. The red is the African portions, the blue is the European portions. And it's really a mosaic with African Americans carrying European pieces in very different parts of their genome. So if you just look at the last chromosome here, chromosome 22, this individual has a large portion here in the center that's European, where this person, who's almost the same percentage of African ancestry, is mostly African in that location. And when we map EQTLs, what we're doing is we're looking at SNPs around the gene. We're not looking at every gene in the genome, or every SNP in the genome. We're looking at SNPs right around that gene. So here, this local ancestry may actually play an effect, have an effect, a confounding effect, potentially, in how we map those EQTLs. And that's the first thing we wanted to see. Are the methods we use to map EQTLs that we've been using in GTEx and many other places actually robust for admixed populations? And this paper actually just is about to come out. And um, what we found is we used uh, local ancestry versus what we call global ancestry. That's really PC correction for EQTL mapping in a group of, this is just African Americans. Uh, this is an NIGMS data set of blood EQTLs. And this is a skeletal muscle set of many different ancestries out of GTEx. And what I want you to notice is first, by correcting for local ancestry, we actually increased our power by a little bit to find EQTLs. Um, that's important because for many of the studies we do, as you saw in GTEx, we have less African Americans in those data sets. We have to be able to increase our power to detect even in small data sets. The other part is that we found these SNPs here. I, I don't know if you can see them. They're in purple. They're well off the diagonal. What that means is they were very significant in global ancestry adjustment, but not significant in local ancestry adjustment. And we wanted to know, were these false positives? Were they things that we just didn't catch with our local ancestry adjustment? So we went and looked at the specific gene expression, and that's shown here. This is the, the global ancestry adjustment for two of these SNPs, and you can see they have strong association to genotype. But if you only look at African Americans that carry two African chromosomes at this position, there is no association uh, to gene expression. Then if you look at Europeans that carry only European chromosomes, there's also no association. So here we're showing that their confounding of local ancestry may actually 
make us map EQTLs incorrectly, that, that local ancestry in recently admixed populations is really important to consider as we move forward into these bigger uh, um, consortia efforts that include diverse populations. Oh, and I, I'll, I'll just say that um, we made our, our, uh, our program, it's called LA Matrix, uh, uh, freely available. So I put the link here for anyone interested. The next thing I looked at was, is ancestry associated with gene expression? And here I'm just using global ancestry uh, as a linear measure, a linear association to gene expression. And the first question I wanted to know was in pharmacogenomic genes. So here we show some of the pharmacogenomic VI, farm GKB VIP genes, and there's some interesting findings. CYP3, uh, CYP2C19 shows a significant association with decreased expression of this gene with increased African ancestry. Why is that important? CYP2C19 converts the antiplatelet drug plate, uh, clopidogrel to its active metabolite. If you can't convert it, you don't have active drug on, on board. And here we show that African Americans, as they have more African ancestry, may have lower expression of this gene. Does that uh, correspond to lack of response to these drugs? We also, also see a vitamin D receptor, VDR, showing increased expression with increased African ancestry. Also very interesting uh, finding, meaning that African Americans that have a lower vitamin D plasma level may be uh, upregulating their receptor to take advantage of that low vitamin D, uh, uh, vitamin D environment. When we did this genome-wide, we found also very interesting hits. This top one here is ApoL1, and for those who aren't in uh, kidney and renal uh, sorts of fields. ApoL1, uh, the SNPs within this gene are significantly associated with chronic kidney disease, but specific for African Americans. Here we show that with increased African ancestry, you have decreased ApoL1 function. So the, this is also available on BioArchives. It's currently out for review, and, and it's really interesting. We're the first ones to really look at liver, a very important um, drug metabolizing and uh, disease a specific organ for gene expression with ancestry. We also did EQTL mapping, and I want to emphasize here, we had a very small set. We had 60 livers that we did this on, and yet, that when we compare to GTEx liver, which is 153 livers, we saw some overlap with uh, the EQTLs we found. The, this Venn diagram shows you E genes. These are genes with significant EQTLs. Um, but we found genes that were not discovered in GTEx, even with their larger sample size. And I want to give you some examples. So here are, are, is a SNP associated to the gene expression of VCORC1. You can see it in GTEx and in our data set. So they are in agreement in this kind of center of the Venn. Here's one that's not associated in GTEx, but is associated in our African Americans. Maybe this is population specific. But this last one is really uh, very interesting. Here is the GTEx data, and you can see there's a trend towards decreased expression with the two genotype. But they don't have enough, they have nobody with that rare genotype because it's rare in European ancestry individuals. But in our African set, we were able to capture all three genotypes and show a significant association to gene expression. And this is because of the differences in allele frequency. So we're able to find SNPs that are EQTLs that GTEx was not able to find because of using African genomes. So in the last few minutes, I just want to talk about our newest initiative, which is our consortium effort. And this has no data. It's just kind of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, this is a, a mock-up from a, from a recent publication describing um, a count, which is the African American Cardiovascular Pharmacogenomics Consortium. And it really stems from this discovery and translational projects. The discovery is to discover new variants that may affect drug phenotypes or drug response phenotypes. And the translation is how do we deliver that back to the physician with SNPs that are important for African Americans to help them guide therapy. But this is really the foundation of lots of other efforts, including our data commons in which we want to release all of the data that we create, whether it's genomic, transcriptomic, clinical, so that other people can use it in a, in a secure environment. Uh, our partnership with uh, community-based pilot projects, our thoughts around implementation outside of academic medical centers. Um, and I just want to show you where we started. We started with two major cities, DC being one of 
them. And here are our partners in DC, as well as Chicago. We have three partners um, institutions in Chicago. Um, all of these centers uh, work in some way for account. And this is what the kind of the overarching goal of account was. So I've told you a lot about genomic studies. Those are uh, GWAS studies to discover what's important for African-Americans in drug response. That's really where we discover things. But the way we move them into clinic is we do outcome studies, learn if they help the patient, if we use this information, and then implement, implementing this into clinical care, which is really difficult and is a whole area that, that, we, that is currently going on. So what, why I wanna put this in here is, there are many medical centers that are already implementing pharmacogenomics. They're using gene, uh, SNP panels to genotype their patients and decide what drugs they should or should not take or what dose they should be on. But all of that is based on genomic studies uh, that were previously published, which a majority of them are European ancestry. So those SNP panels are really built off of European data. They don't account for African ancestry uh, specific uh, variants. We need to accelerate that pace. So we started uh, recruiting African Americans. We tried to collect all different types of data, whether it's clinical response, DNA, transcriptome data, as well as uh, cryopreserving PBMCs for IPSC uh, reprogramming and differentiation, differentiation at some point. Um, the first um, drugs we started with were the anticoagulants that I told you about. We already have done a lot of work with warfarin, but we need larger cohorts. The new oral anticoagulants, NOACs or DOACs, actually there have been no genome-wide studies. So we decided we'd make the first one in African Americans. And then clopidogrel. This is an antiplatelet agent that I, I described to you as needing that conversion to active metabolite. That is a, a very actionable and ready for uh, that Many, many universities are using to genotype people with and then decide what medications, what antiplatelet agents they should use. However, we don't know if there are other variants that may affect African Americans. This is our GPS system. This is a part of our translational project. So this is in collaboration um, with my colleague at University of Chicago, uh, Peter O'Donnell and David Meltzer. Um, this GPS stands for Genomic Prescribing System. And it's a way to deliver to, to physicians uh, what drugs, they genotype their patients and then give you only the drugs your patient is on and use a stoplight signal here to tell you if it's um, okay to use it, green light, not okay to use it, red light, as well as alternatives and the primary data that, uh, that backs up these studies. Um, for the sake of time, I'm actually gonna skip this. This was a really great video produced by our community partners and uh, I'll try and make that available to you. It's, it's one of our great efforts to incorporate community partners that help spread the message of, of, uh, of inclusion and, and helping uh, recruit for genomic studies. Uh, this is our website, all of our pilot projects, the video I, I just skipped over, as well as our Twitter account are here if you wanna see the work that we're doing in account. Um, and at this point, I, I want to just make one short disclaimer. Here are all the people that helped, and, and this is my lab, but the people I want to really thank are the patients that I recruit for these studies. When I started that first study um, in CYP2C, uh, the, the CYP3A4 genes, I recruited all of my patients myself. And it was such a learning experience to learn how to recruit minority populations and the invaluable help I got from the nurses and physicians, especially minority nurses and minority physicians in helping me to engage that community and recruit them into my studies. And really those patients and the donors from our liver, our liver work are, are really advancing our science and are the, are the real stars of this show. Um, and this is our account consortium. This was our last annual meeting. We had close to 100 people attend. And when I started account, I actually had this naive idea that we would be, you know, 10 people in a room discussing African American pharmacogenomics and we'd be the only ones interested. But really there's so many people, community partners, uh, we've, we've now expanded into other partnerships like at the University of Pittsburgh, we have uh, consultants for community efforts at Howard University. This has grown bigger than I think I could have ever imagined and really it's a, it's a huge team effort. All these people contribute their time and their effort to making this this uh, very 
uh, important work happen. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions you may have. OK, why don't we start on the left here? Really excellent talk. Um, I just wanted to uh, expand upon a little bit more of the DOAC discussion yeah. in terms of uh, discovering variants that are clinically relevant. Um, it's really a twofold question. In terms of the clinical trials that en enrolled patients on these studies, um, do you find that the minorities are accurately represented on those trials? And then in addition, uh, it's noting on how you've tracked INR from three to four to find some potentially really clinically relevant variants. Um, there's really not much INR monitoring going on in these studies since they claim to have such a very well-defined therapeutic window. So the thought is, how do you plan to approach finding uh, significant variants without having such a biomarker present to where you can basically uncover risk of bleeding? Again, really great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Those were uh, wonderful questions, and it's kind of something I glossed over when we talked about uh, the DOAC. So, yes, I have been talking to the the original clinical trials and trying to get that data. I believe there are very few African Americans um, enrolled in those trials, but I, I don't know the exact number, so I don't want to speak out of turn on that. For your second question, which is how do we figure out the biomarker, we actually just measured the biomarker ourselves. So we're getting anti-10A uh, clinical levels on every patient that's enrolled. So there's twofold sort of genomic analysis. One is on that anti-10A marker, which we may have more power to detect things that may be related to loss of response or, or, or great, you know, over response. And then we're looking at bleeding and clotting while on medication. So there's a six month follow up for all of our patients that we enrolled. And so far, we have had uh, some bleeding and clotting events on patients that are on medications. And we now know the time of their dose and their anti 10 A level. So we're, we're using that to, to guide our GWAS study. Again, thank you for an absolutely wonderful presentation. I really appreciated all of the resources you have out there for people like myself who are trying to study different differential outcomes in African American um, patients. My slight disappointment was that you didn't mention my patient population, which is people who've had organ transplants. And because we know that uh, there is a differential metabolism of the key immunosuppressive drugs, but even more importantly, we know that they have such differential uh, in sup inferior outcomes for African-American patients. So what about uh, metabolism? In, of these important drugs in African-American patients. Yes, that's a, what are the genetic factors? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's a really interesting question. We've actually been trying to partner with uh, different transplant uh, uh, departments to answer that question, to look at transplant, uh, you know, graft versus host disease and re rejection rates related to uh, drug metabolism. Right now, the thinking is it is around CYP3As, uh, and maybe it's all the splice variant that I discussed. Maybe there's other variants. Um, I I think an in-depth study is absolutely necessary. It's certainly not something I'm not interested in. Uh, it, it, would be, it would be wonderful to have partners to do that. Great. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, if not, I have one question. Sure. Uh, and again, I will join others thanking you for a wonderful talk. Um, I was very intrigued about your account um, program and your emphasis on implementation. Mm. And that's something we do a lot in our center at NHLBI. Um, could you just say a little bit more about what kinds of activities are going on and is it an implementation research type agenda or uh, those kinds of things? So the, the project is really on translation and adoption of new technology in, in pharmacogenomics specifically. So I, I kind of glossed over this, but what we're doing is we recruit both physicians that deliver the care as well as patients. We get a blood sample from them. Many of these are inpatients now. They're in a hospital, um, the hospitalist network at, uh, we're trying to spread it to three institutions in Chicago as a starting point. We recruit patients, physicians, we genotype them on a very comprehensive SNP panel. So these are SNPs that are uh, known to affect uh, uh, drug response as well as things that are po population specific. So things that may specifically only affect African Americans, but we t genotype them. So we have that information. Then we will deliver it back in the GPS, which is, is actually integrated into our EHR 
uh, to the physician at the point of care so that when they see that patient again, they can look at their medications and see if there are things that may, may need to be changed. They can look up any drug they're thinking of prescribing and seeing if there's genetic information. But the, the delivery of that information is actually specific to the patient. So as opposed to everything you could test for and does it affect this patient or not? It, it's very specific, it's personalized care for that patient. And the question we're trying to answer is, even in a heavy clinical load, like an inpatient environment, will physicians use this information to guide therapy? Okay, great, and with that, we're out of time. Let's give uh, Dr. Pereira a big hand. <laughs> and thank you all. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the great, great question, yeah, too. Yeah, thank yeah. You.